Tonight on News 5 Live, Tracy Tegerpanton aims to break the UDP glass ceiling. Agricultural Group and Belize Chamber of Commerce warn GOB about jittery investors. And a southern community watches helplessly as the sea swallows up their town. These stories and more up next on News 5 Live. We have been a partner with SMART for over 10 plus years. We have a full SMART plan we use for, as our major driver for our business. We have a service that rolls over in that if you call one and it is busy, it rolls over to the next line. So once you call us, you can get us at any time. Before we got this SMART service, we were paying upwards of nearly $2,000 in phone bills. Since we've had our SMART service, we pay an average of about $600, so we've had tremendous saving, more than 50%. For the businesses, if you want to save money, switch to SMART because it is far more cost-effective and the service is excellent. SMART continues to be innovative in bringing new technology and meaningful savings during these challenging times to businesses across Belize. Sign up for our VoIP technology or broadband packages and save more. It's almost lunchtime and Alice is getting hungry and forgot to bring cash. She remembers that eCash now has a geolocation feature in which she can easily view the eCash merchants near her, especially restaurants. Her co-workers also ask her to order food for them. Chicken chow mein, please, and a Coke. The merchant sends her the payment link, she taps confirm, and within a few minutes, her food is delivered. Alice then views her transaction history and taps on the transaction recently made, then taps the split the bill button where she selects the unevenly option and moves the bar to the desired amount per person. The request is then sent to her friends. Her colleagues accept the request and are ready to enjoy their meals. Geolocation and splitting the bill via eCash make Alice's life a whole lot easier. television advertising have we got a deal for you advertise on channel 5's daily classifieds channel 5's daily classifieds is one of the most effective methods for introducing yourself and your business to the community use our daily classifieds to recruit employees promote specials promote your products or services promote a business opportunity increase traffic to your website and advertise items you have for sale let us help you save valuable time and money. Call us today at 223-0146 or visit us at our offices on Pony Drive to discuss how we can help your business grow affordably. Channel 5's Daily Classifieds. Advertise today. is brought to you by the Belize Bank Limited. Our country, your bank. 
Good evening and welcome to News 5 Live for Wednesday, February 2nd. I am Sabrina Daly. Following his swearing in as leader of the opposition on Tuesday, area representative in the Mesopotamia division, Shine Barrow, came out swinging at his fellow Albert area representative, Tracy Tager Panton, for comments she made about due process not being followed in making him leader of the opposition. Barrow suggested that when she had the opportunity to stand up for gender-based violence victims, for women, and for the party, she refused. But Tager Panton has maintained that she was merely abiding by the oath that she took to follow the party's constitution. When I became a standard bearer for the United Democratic Party, I swore an oath of office that I would respect the constitution of the party, I would uphold the procedures of the party, that I would respect the organs of this party, and that is what I stand for. It is my principal position. It was the position I take then, and it's the position I take now. It is not for the member from Mesop to appoint me as leader of the opposition in the House. In my view, that decision ought to be taken by the decision makers of the party, who are the delegates of the party. I believe then, as I believe now, that we had an obligation, a responsibility to consult with members of the National Party Council to determine the will of the party, and that was not done. Um, and I was not prepared to stand against the very oath of office that I gave to the United Democratic Party. The constitution of the country does provide that the majority of members on the, that sit on the opposition side of the House can determine who the leader of the opposition is in the House. It trumps the... And it, it trumps the party's constitution. It, it, I, I don't want to say it trumps the party's constitution. There is a supreme law of the land, and it indicates that in the National Assembly, there are three persons who can make that determination if they see fit. Um, and that has been done. I understand that the Honorable Hugo Pat, who is our deputy leader, the Honorable Denise Barrow, and the Honorable Shine Barrow has signed that letter. My view is that three persons, although they have been elected, also swore to uphold the constitution of the party. It is our first oath of office we take. And in the, the spirit of the constitution of the United Democratic Party is that we ought to consult the organs of the party, the Central Executive Committee, and the National Party Council. That has not been done. Tager Panton says that her party is in such dire straits, and in her opinion, she is really the only choice for the delegates to vote for at the next UDP leadership convention on March 27th. She says the party needs to appeal not just to its faithful, but also the undecided voters. I am the only decision in my view, that the delegates can make. The UDP credibility of this party is at an all-time low. I would go further to say we are at rock bottom and we need to choose a leader that has the experience and my record of service to this country is unparalleled and it's proven. We need to choose a leader that can rebuild and heal this party. No, we can't choose a leader that is polarizing and divisive. We have to choose a leader that will respect our delegates and stand on principle as to what the mandate of the UDP as, is as a mass political party. We need to choose a leader that can be inclusive and ensure there is as much diversity as we can, can have in the party. You see, we have to appeal to the stalwarts of this party and to the supporters of this party, but them alone will not win us an election. 
there are lots of independent voters sitting on the fence waiting to see what we will do in terms of regaining our credibility, in terms of uh, really cementing, uh, inspiring the trust and confidence of the Belizean people in the leadership that we choose. Of course, all these comments keep coming up about your not a quote-unquote um, full-bred UDP <laughs> that you was Philip Goldston was, was, was a full-bred UDP. Philip Goldston is a founding member of the People's United Party. I, you know, I reject that out of hand. I think it is malicious and simply meant to try and malign my candidacy. But the delegates of this party and the people of this party know exactly what I stand for. All right, and then um, we keep hearing about this third person who has not yet come forth officially to say, mm -hmm. yes, I'm also in the race. But names are being called. Mm -hmm. Actually, one name is being called. Mm -hmm. And it's another man mm -hmm. from what we've heard. So you would be the only woman. Mm -hmm. Does this put you, you think, at a disadvantage? Breaking the glass ceiling is perhaps the most difficult challenge I will have in this campaign. But I have no doubt that I can do it. And the reason I don't have any doubt that I can do it, because while I am a woman, and that's very obvious, I am not running on the, uh, the, the, the matter of gender only. I am running because I am capable. The mess that the UDP finds itself in since Patrick Faber's downfall two weeks ago and the internal scuffle for the leadership position have dominated the news almost every day since. At an event for the Ministry of Housing today, News 5 asked Minister Julius Espat for his views on the challenges the opposition is going through. He says credibility is the UDP's biggest problem at this time. I see five people across the aisle. I see two persons that were accused of domestic abuse. One that has been incarcerated. I see another that has been accused of Toyota mal miss, miss, you want to call it any kind of way. I have seen another that is like a, I call it a ghost person. Total disrespect for the house that never appears. And I see another that lacks trust from her party because they're not sure if she's a PUP or UDP. And so that's what I see across the line. And so how can I even debate properly? How can I even practice democracy when there's nothing across the line? That's a sad situation for Belize. The national budget has another month or so before it is presented in the House of Representatives. And it will be interesting to see which ministries get an increase and which don't. The Minister of Housing and Infrastructure Development, Julius Espat, has been critical for years of the skeletal budgets allotted for the oversight bodies, such as the Auditor General's Office and the Integrity Commission. While he would like to see those budgets increased, he also wants to see public officers get their 10% as soon as possible. The Auditor General made an incredible report to us about two cabinets ago. She came and she gave a, a, a detailed analysis of what she found when she was there. And she gave us a draft proposed legislation in how to make sure that the Auditor General um, is independent, the office of the Auditor General. Um, Cabinet received it extremely well and we have forwarded that to the Attorney General. So she will go through the legal parameters to see if what they are proposing is in line with the Constitution. But um, at that meeting and in public, I have been quite vocal that I believe that the, the, um, the judiciary, which we know should be independent, but also the, the oversight bodies. That's why I fought for PAC to be able to... You see, to be independent, you do it in various ways. One is financial independence, which is what I believe the Auditor General needs, so that she can be able to not have to go beg to a minister to do something, and also have the ability to hire her own staff. That, I believe, is critical. That is part of the proposed legislation, and I support that. Um, then you have the PAC was another um, issue to deal with oversight. That one was not a financial aspect initially, but it will become also. So we have managed to have PAC re reconstituted where it's a bicameral. 
It is also to hold the hearings in public and then the next step will be to give PUP. Um, similar to what the Auditor General is requesting. Well, the first thing I would clamor for is that the salaries are given back to the people that 10% were taken away. So you're asking me, I would strongly, strongly ask for that to be returned before we do anything else. So if you have to do some kind of negotiation for that to happen, that's priority in my point of view. I work with public servants that are working extremely hard um, over time, not collecting the overtime and working with 10% less and they have given the Ministry of Infrastructure Development, they are all in 2021 and so it is our responsibility to fight for them to at least get back to the norm and then fight for them to get more. So to me that's the priority. The controversial free, prior and informed consent protocol has been fi filed with the Caribbean Court of Justice, much to the chagrin of the Toledo Alcaldes Association and the Maya Leaders Alliance. The focal point of the dispute between representatives of the indigenous community and the government of Belize is a perceived lack of consultation regarding the drawing up of the document. Earlier this week, TAA MLA spokesperson Christina Cox said that they were never consulted prior to the formalization of the FPIC document. She maintains that the Commission of Indigenous Peoples Affairs never engaged the Toledo Alcaldes Association nor the Maya Leaders Alliance. Right. We don't know who they consulted. They, they are saying that they consulted. They certainly did not consult the Toledo Alcaldes Association and the Maya Leaders Alliance. Um, after the last compliance hearing in November, um, even after the guidance of the court, the court basically told them, you have to sit with the, with the other parties, right? You have to sit with, with the TAA and the MLA and you have to come to some kind of mutually agreeable uh, protocol before you submit it to the court. Uh, at no point, all of November, all of December, all of January, we learned of it on after, uh, you know, on the day that they filed to the CCJ, which was, uh, I believe, on the 27th of this month. And so, you know, that just tells you that the government is unwilling. They seem to be unwilling to engage with us. I think that if they had, um, if they had engaged with us, there is no doubt that we would have um, been open to dialogue on this, on, on the new revisions and see where are the concerns, what are the issues, what still needs to be worked out. Um, and then be able to come to some kind of, of mutual um, agreement that would move the process forward because we do want to move the process forward. Commissioner Greg Chaok, on the other hand, has presented a trove of documents supporting his claim that TAA MLA were indeed consulted at various stages of the process. According to Chaok, an exchange of opinions with all relevant stakeholders on what the FPIC protocol should contain was critical to formulating the, doc the document. We have consulted with them extensively, respectfully, and equally because we believe that all of them have the same standing. all of them collectively and individually. They have the sectors of the Maya society that they represent. So we have to respect them, which leads me to the consultation. I believe in consultation. I have demanded consultation from the government of Belize when I was in the Maya Leaders Alliance when I was at Satim, I've demanded the right of the Maya people to free prior and informed consent. And the requirement that they should be involved in formulating the policies. So I pursue the work of the government, anchoring the work on consultation that I demanded. I would not be here before you if we had not consulted extensively all the Mayan organizations. I don't want to be here to tell you we consult. In front of you here, 
all the, these are just some of the documents of the exchange of proposal, exchange of revision of the FPIC protocol, objections, my response to, uh, to those objections, the face-to-face -face meeting uh, transcript. The issue of the FPIC protocol has, to some extent, polarized the Maya community with organizations, including the Sarstun Tamash Institute for Indigenous Management, taking a position against the Maya Leaders Alliance. That division, says Cha'ok, is regrettable, particularly since the Brisenu administration seems committed to implement the terms of the CCJ's consent order. It's clear that there is intractable tension in the membership. This is affecting the implementation process. The internal conflict comes at a time when, in my view, we have a government that is committed to give effect to the terms of the consent order. So I ask the leaders of the Maya Leaders Alliance, the member organization, to reflect back to what caused the Maya people to start this in the first place. One of our greatest strengths and uh, the reason that we have been so successful uh, over the last 30 years as we have gone to the courts, as we have, uh, um, you know, gotten those very historic judgments has been because we have been a united people. And so it's not surprising that our unity is under attack. The epic that we got upon taking office and, and as we continue to do the consultation. It is unfortunate that I have not found a community who have said, we know what is in that document. But yet, it is a right that they must exercise, that they must know. We have to change this, and that is what we need to change. We, we are going to do it in partnership with the organizations. Mm -hmm. We are going to respect the organization because they have a role to play. They provide the technical. They provide the financial resources to the communities. But most importantly, we are going to consult with the villagers, sit down with the villagers, to ensure that collectively we put together the necessary measures and legislation that protects the rights of the community. Coming up, after residents of a nearby community complained about air pollution, the sugar mill responds. Find out how BSI is making their factory emissions cleaner when we return. Digi, the premier name in voice and data, is also the country's leading provider of innovative services and solutions for small business and enterprise. At Digi Business, we offer solutions, tools, and applications to support your business needs. Reduce costs, improve efficiency, and excel in a changing world where no idea is too big and no task is too small. From technology advising to design implementation and management, our team of qualified solution sales and specialists can develop a reliable and robust infrastructure, allowing you to spend more time on what matters most, your business. Visit us online to explore how DigiBusiness innovative products and solutions can help your business reduce costs and improve efficiency. Thank you. 
Belligan, the Bear of Belize. New Year's is a time for us to make hearty resolutions that will help us better our lives and then promptly forget about them. However, there are some resolutions we shouldn't forget about. Join us for our new series, 100%, where we'll be talking about being 100% in on things like our relationship with God, our spouses, finances, and more. Tune in at 10 a.m. right here on Channel 5 Belize. Keep your business running efficiently with computer products and accessories from Cinden World. We are the largest electronic stores in Belize, providing business solutions from trusted brands, including Dell, HP, Lenovo, and Samsung, just to name a few. Our range of business PCs and electronics include desktop computers, laptops, desktop monitors, mouses, battery backups, smart TVs, and computer accessories that are backed up by warranties to keep your business always running running smoothly. Call or visit us at any of our five Cellular World locations in Belize City, Belmopan or San Pedro and let our knowledgeable team help you to find the right solutions. Cellular World, low prices, more choices. Hospital Galenia es el único hospital de Quintana Roo en contar con la más completa unidad de medicina nuclear, poniendo a su alcance la mejor tecnología especializada diagnóstico y tratamiento de enfermedades, en las que se utilizan cantidades muy pequeñas de radiofármacos para diagnosticar anomalías dentro del cuerpo. Hospital Galenia, más que un hospital. Last night, we told you about the legal challenge that Belize brought against Trinidad and Tobago before the CCJ. The government of Belize accused the Republic of importing non-caricum brown sugar without applying a 40% common external tariff, a requirement under the revised Treaty of Chagrawamas. This would have severely affected the competitiveness of BSI's brown sugar in that market. If the claim was proven, Trinidad would have had to explain. But the CCJ ruled that there were severe shortcomings to the evidence Belize provided in their claim. BSI played a key role in the hearings and collecting of data. Today, Communications Director at BSI, William Neal, commented on the outcome of the legal challenge. On the one hand, what we were trying to do was to amass enough evidence that would put, shift the burden to uh, Trinidad. Of course, if you're importing into your country, you control that information. So at the very start of the um, case itself, they fought to have certain inf um, information not allowed. And they said they couldn't locate um, other information. So that, that was key. But we went through um, international databases to actually prove that these sugars were coming into the region, right? And um, our regional commercial director, Rui Martinez, and uh, our VP, Mac, did a very good job of letting the judges understand that process and that you can look at what is happening within the market to actually understand that there are some challenges and obviously the market is distorted. We could not convince them, however, um, using the information that we had. We still have a, a window of three to five years to um, refile the case. I think some lessons were learned, but it served a very important purpose for us. We saw, in terms of market access, from 2019 to 2020, there was a doubling of the amount of sugar sold into CARICOM. And from 2020 to 2021, there was a doubling again. So if it was five, it went to 10, and then from 10 to 20, which is significant. And all of the, that change came after the case was actually filed, which means that, you know, people are taking notice. And for us as BSI, we wanted people to understand that we're going to monitor the market, that we have the ability to do that. To prevent any further standoffs, BSI and the Belize Sugarcane Farmers Association are in negotiations as they attempt to finalize a commercial agreement by the end of the sugar crop. 
Their first meeting was held on January 18th, where, B where BSI reportedly laid out the financial reports on Bagas earnings. More meetings are to follow, and Chavarria says he is confident that both parties will find common ground. Without getting into too much details because uh, discussions are ongoing, we have had uh, an initial meeting with the BSEFA on the 18th of January. So we received some questions, provided feedback to the BSEFA. Since then, we've exchanged additional information. Uh, and so right now, those discussions are ongoing. Uh, the next step really is for the BSEFA to come back to us with some feedback on what we've presented and keep the discussions going because we want to ensure that before the end of uh, this crop, uh, we have a long-term agreement in place with the BSEFA. That, that is really critical because we don't want to go into another off season where we have doubt lingering on our heads. Because uh, all it will do is just keep back, um, you know, investment. There, there won't be any confidence from both stakeholders. Uh, I think both the mill and the farmers as well. They will wonder, well, should I be replanting if I'm not sure if we'll have the same troubles next year? So it's really important that we get a long-term agreement signed uh, before the end of this crop so that we go into the off season, you know, knowing that we're just focused on getting the mill ready. Back in 2019, the community of Chan Pine Ridge in the Orange Walk District claimed it was being affected by air pollution from BSI. Residents were especially concerned that the ashes emitted might contain hazardous chemicals. BSI has since made a significant investment in its air emission system to drastically reduce the level of ash particles. The difference between what was being emitted then and what is being emitted now at face value presents a stark contrast. BSI is boasting cleaner, much healthier air emissions that meet standards set by the Department of Environment. Today, the company unveiled their $6 million investment. News 5's Paul Lopez has the story. The plumes of smoke emerging from the Belize Sugar Industry Compound on Tower Hill are generated from their energy production plant. The company burns bagash, the waste from sugar cane used to produce sugar, to produce energy. A percentage of that energy powers the factory's operations, and a percentage is sold to the country's power grids. And in those plumes, naturally, there are ashes floating around from the burning of the bagash. Saidi Linus, EHS regional manager at BSI, explained that it is these ash particles that cause the dark coloration in the plumes of smoke. It's just like dust, you know? It's, it, it's dust. Essentially, well, if you, it's an allergen, I would say, so perhaps that would have been the, the, biggest, the biggest issue. Even here, as we sit, if, if we are not used to having a lot of dust as we have around the area, then you know, it's something similar. It's particulate matter, not really something that is, that is chemical. Uh, a lot of people have this misconception that, oh, it's chemicals coming out of that stock. It's a plume, but essentially what makes it dark is when you burn paper, it's dark. You know, it's just the nature of it, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. While the ashes are not necessarily bad, by DOE standard, the volume of particles being emitted into the air by the company was double the particulate emission parameter. The factory's electric-based air emission system, referred to as the Electrostatic System Precipitator, ESP for short, was identified as one of the causes of the problem. So what's the function of the ESP? It's simply to collect the ash particles, not to go into the air. So, how does this work? Electrostatic precipitator. It uses electricity to charge the particles, the ash particles, so they collect on a opposite pole charged plate. So if you have a positive and a negative, they both merge and then it collects on the plate. This then is agitated or vibrated and then it falls down to the bottom into a hopper which is conveyed into a, another hopper which is then transported outside the, the facility. That system became antiquated and grew inefficient over time, causing the need for a newer, more updated one. Installed during the off-season on one of BSI's two boilers, a new air emission system came into commission only a couple weeks ago. Instead of electric fields, it uses a dust collector and a wet scrubber described as a dry system and a wet system. The bigger particles, ash particles, are collected by the dust 
collector. Whatever smaller particles are not that are not collected by the dust collector is then sprayed with water, as it says, a uh, wet scrubber system. All it's doing is wetting the particles that then, due to gravity, heads downwards, then it goes into the clarifier. This is the clarifier, a hot bath of steaming water and ash particles that would have made it into the air we breathe, if not for the wet scrubber. It collects at the bottom of the chimney, transfers into the clarifier, where the ash is separated from the water. The water is then recycled through one of the several open air ponds on the compound. This is the ash particles removed by the dust collector. This would have also made it into the air, leading to potentially severe allergy flare-ups. This first phase of the investment of six million is part of a total investment of 11 million we're doing to replace the air emission system for the power plant. Uh, it's really a, a, an important milestone for us. We're really proud of this achievement. The upgrade in the quality of air now emitted from the power plant is evident. The new system discharges a thick white plume, which is the cleaner air, while the old electric system emits a darker plume. It's a positive project for the project. I mean, sorry, for the community. Um, you know, we have over 99% of our employees here are, are Belizeans, and a lot of them work in this community. So even our employees are extremely proud uh, that, you know, we've been able to bring these two major projects, right, uh, to, to fruition. And we look forward to completing the second phase, which will be done in this off crop period um, on the second boiler, so that going forward you will see two very clean air emission stops. And in case you are wondering what becomes of the dust and wet ash particles, those are trucked off the compound and used in fields across the north to improve the soil's quality. Reporting for News 5, I am Paul Lopez. With its latest upgrades, which also includes the water cooling system that was commissioned at the start of the sugar crop, Will BSI be able to shake off the negative public perception that it has garnered over the years? The company has been accused on numerous occasions of being one of the main water and air pollutants in the district. That question was put to Sean Chavaria, the Director of Finance at ASR BSI. That's why you have laws and, and regulation, right? And, and that's the importance of ensuring that when we did this project, we had to do it right. So we had to get the engineering correct. We had to get the design correct. Uh, all that was reviewed by the Department of Environment. And we have performance guarantees as well to say that, look, this new system will ensure that you meet the regulations. So we're confident that with the investment we've put in, that matter is addressed. If there are lingering issues, then that is where the DOE will need to come in to see what other contributing factors might be affecting that community. Uh, not far away is the municipal dump site. So they, that will be an area that they have to look at. Uh, so that will, just like the New River, will have to be something that's continuous improvement involving the DOE, involving the community as well. It's a hope that with uh, the visibility of what you see today, um, you would have seen the, the comparison of the two air emission systems, the old and the new. I think visibly you would see a major difference. Um, it's really a white plume going out, uh, which shows that the air is clean. And so from that standpoint, we are hopeful that the community will see this as a positive step in the right direction and that when we do the second phase, really it's a culmination of a commitment that we made to the community, including the Champarich Committee who we've invited here before. Uh, and we committed to them that by this year we will get it done. And so we are, we're living up to that commitment. News 5 also followed up with Chavaria on BSI's report last month that sugarcane was coming was coming in with extraneous matter that threatened to shut down the mill. He says some 15,000 tons of sugarcane had deteriorated in quality as a result of the blockade in front of the SRBSI compound at the start of the sugar crop. But he says the quality of cane they are now receiving has improved. We saw that for roughly four days after the crop resumed on the 3rd of January that the quality was really poor. Uh, and so it showed that there was quite a bit of cane out there that had been prepared uh, to enter the mill and didn't have the opportunity to do so. And so it took us four days to really get out that, that material. I think what we did was really, the, in a sense, a lesser of all evils. We took the cane in, even though it was not of good quality, 
and then we'll figure out with the stakeholders how we adjust for the quality uh, the quality matter that it wasn't at the right quality right so at the end of the day though everybody got the opportunity to bring in that cane so that we can get the crop going and now you know we're seeing much better quality cane after the break, keeping the sea at bay in Monkey River. News 5 tries to find out why the village is washing away and what can be done. But first, here's a look at the latest COVID-19 figures. mobile experience in Belize? You don't know? Well, the truth is, Digi, our national telecom, of course. Digi has the largest mobile LTE advanced network with over 96% countrywide coverage, offering the fastest mobile LTE data speeds at the most affordable rates with mobile plans that fit your lifestyle. The truth is... Only Digi gives the ultimate mobile LTE experience. Visit your nearest Digi store to join the bigger, better network today. Digi, our national telecom. Visit us online at www.livedigi.com. The Social Security Board, in collaboration with the Labor Department, takes this opportunity to remind insured persons of the requirements for compensation when on sick leave. Any employee who has worked with an employer for at least two months is entitled to 16 working days of sick leave with full pay every year. This is how it works. Upon approval of a sickness or injury benefit claim by SSB, 80% of the employee's weekly insurable earnings is paid as a social security benefit and the difference in the employee's salary is paid by the employer. This is to ensure that the employee does not suffer any loss of wages when ill. After 16 days, compensation for sick leave is paid as a social security benefit only. Some conditions apply. This message is brought to you by the Social Security Board and the Labor Department. Social Security Board, safeguarding you, your family, your future. Hospital Galenia es el único hospital de Quintana Roo en contar con la más completa unidad de medicina nuclear, poniendo a su alcance la mejor tecnología especializada diagnóstico y tratamiento de enfermedades en las que se utilizan cantidades muy pequeñas de radiofármacos para diagnosticar anomalías dentro del cuerpo. Hospital Galenia, más que un hospital. The ministry is collaborating with Speednet Communications to have a vaccination campaign for children ages 12 to 17 years. Children who get vaccinated will get a chance to win fabulous prizes, including backpacks with supplies, Nintendo Switch, tablets, book tuitions, and MiFi with three months data. 
Only children 12 to 17 years old can participate in this smart and Ministry of Health and Wellness raffle. At vaccination sites, each vaccinated child, upon being vaccinated, will receive a ticket to place their name, age, date of birth, BHIS number, and contact information on, which will be filled out by a parent or legal guardian. The sooner a person vaccinates, the more chances he or she will have to win. Get vaccinated, please. Vaccination saves lives. With all the talk about global climate change and man-made environmental issues, it's easy to lose sight of actual people being affected by changes beyond their control. Tonight, Dwayne Moody has the story of a small place and small group of residents who are literally watching the Caribbean Sea swallow their community. They keep moving their houses, even the tombs of their loved ones, trying to keep one step ahead of Mother Nature. But will it work? And what else can be done? News 5 traveled south looking for answers. Approximately 12 miles down this dirt road rests the coastal community of Monkey River, one of the oldest and most remote villages in the country. Residents say that Monkey River was once a thriving town. Hello. Hello. It used to be a town in the past, then it reduced to a village and now I will say it's just a settlement because it's like approximately 250 people here. Due to erosion and climate change, Monkey River has been dwindling, not only in population size, but also in land mass. It has taken a lot of homes already. We have to relocate it. Some of the homes that already relocated, the water is there already again at their doorstep. Every year to me it's it's getting worse and worse. The water tends to come in closer and closer to our home. Approximately five years ago, the southernmost part of Monkey River Village was a couple hundred yards away near that septic tank in the distance. Since then, this entire area is now underwater. Families had to relocate. And as we can see today, they might have to relocate once again. We're the last house in the village, so we're the closest to the cemetery. And the erosion just keeps going like normal. And we had to relocate. My mom relocated to this house. But as you can see now, the water is already 20 to 40 feet. The house is already 20 to 40 feet by the water shore again. So the, uh, we believe the only thing that's helping the house is this tree. So the moment this tree fall, we're back at square one again. We were okay at first and then people tried to help. We used sandbags, we used post with tires. But after a while, like nothing, we just washed away again and no, nothing we try is help. Fishing and tourism are the lifeblood of the traditional Creole community which sits at the easternmost tip of Toledo district. But their way of life is under constant threat. Over the last two decades, its sandy beaches have washed away. Residents have been displaced from their lands, which are now part of the sea. And as the water inches closer to homes, even the dead is being affected as a portion of the cemetery is submerged. These decades' worth of changes have been witnessed by Godwin Coleman, the eldest man in the village. A house me there, about a mile from here. And um, actually, the, the house where we were there had land in front. And all of that gone. Well, in the old day, you could look at it, put on the ground. But in the old day, you can't. You have to go in a canoe. The cemetery is already underwater. Well, the biggest part of it, the front is already, some of the grave already been in water. Yeah, wash away. We had us to relocate. Well, you know that some of them that was in tomb, they just moved the tomb higher because, you know, people, loved ones are there. And yes, they're already gone, but we have feeling. So what happened? A 2021 assessment carried out by Cuban experts revealed that coastal erosion is evident in areas such as Dangriga, Hopkins and Monkey River. 
The Monkey River Watershed Association contends that the root causes of the erosion are complex. The attention about this erosion started really back in 1998, right after Hurricane Mitch. Um, and since then we have had Hurricane Iris, which devastated this area. And right after Hurricane Iris, we had earthquake in 2009 that actually sunk the place a bit. Apart from, you know, uh, we are looking at climate change and sea level rise and all of that, um, we still believe one of the, one of the biggest problems uh, that we are seeing with the erosion here comes from the activities that's happening on the watershed. It is believed that the watershed has lost its capacity to push beach building material down the river and replenish the coastline. During flood um, times, it flushes out the, the beach building materials to the sea and then with currents and, and the wave action and the wind, then that brings it back to the coastline and replenish uh, what was, was taken naturally. That, that function happening. is not happening mm -hmm. anymore on the watershed for several reasons from what we can see. Um, and that includes agricultural practices on the watershed um, as well as gravel and sand mining that's taking place on the watershed. Some people say <coughs> that banana, the cars are banana but in. When I know he wash away in, no banana, no, no banana, no drain, never day. Never day. So maybe that does make it worse? I feel so. Given the fading situation, is Monkey River Village at risk of being wiped off the map? The reality is that many have migrated to urban areas for various reasons. But for the 250 persons still living there, Monkey River is home. Ariane Mustramp fears that this historic village may become just a memory. We have no other choice to relocate to where, maybe we don't want to move because Monkey River is home. Monkey River is always going to be home. So. You think it's, it's pushing that you guys might have to leave the village completely? If it doesn't stop for sure, it's without a doubt. We have, have to move. Is it frightening? Of course, it is. Sometimes... It's like, what will happen to my generation, generation after mine? Is, nobody's going to know what Monk River really is, the beauty of Monk River. Association President Mario Muschamp says that over the years, several assessments were conducted by Galen University, Dr. Peter Esselman, and the U.S. Geological Service. For us, first and foremost is to try and keep what we have and not lose anymore. Yeah. So that will require us started doing some sort of coastal protection um, mitigation work outside here to address um, the issue of not losing more than we already lost. And then work on the watershed and work on restoring that so that then that can con start putting back those sediments out that will replenish um, on the beach. Naturally, we have come up with a plan called the Roadmap for the Restoration of the Monker Functions of the Monk River Watershed. And, and, and we are currently through the Monk River Watershed Watershed Association seeking funding to implement that plan. Dwayne Muda for News 5. The 17 members of the Belize Agroproductive Sector Group have written to the Prime Minister with a list of concerns about the government's handling of recent events, out-of-date legislation and tax structures that are affecting investor confidence. The first issue raised is government's failure to enforce the law when criminal acts are committed against investors and investments. This ostensibly refers to the Port of Belize strike, the attacks on sugarcane farms in the West, and the blockade at BSI a few weeks ago. The second is what they term antiquated regulations in the agriculture and agro-processing fields that are burdensome and restrict growth in many of Belize's traditional crops. They are asking for full or partial deregulation of the citrus, sugarcane industry, banana industry, pesticides control and grain acts. Finally, the group is seeking clear and consistent application of the tax laws and incentives. In particular, they cite the GST refunds pass due to the sector, which amount to millions of dollars. They also say many large farms do not qualify for designated processing area program, although they produce exports that must compete in international markets. Among the signatories to the letter to the Prime Minister were at least six Mennonite agricultural groups, Five Belize, Belize Sugar Industries, Hummingbird Citrus, Circle R Products and Obregon Coconut Company Limited. The group says they collectively represent $1 billion Belize dollars of local and foreign investment, 
But at the moment, the investment climate right now has now is slowing down, posing significant risk to the local economy and employment. The Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry has fired off a letter of its own to the Prime Minister, echoing the sentiments raised by the Agro Processing Group. The BCCI points to recent cases or, as they term it, turn it, term it, that is, certain actors who have been squatting on private property, damaging property or illegally blocking access to businesses through threats of violence. They also point to the blockade of the ASR BSI sugar factory, saying although the action was illegal, law enforcement took no steps to clear it or deter the civil disobedience. Just days later, law enforcement also failed to intervene when stevedores entered the compound of the Port of Belize Limited without authority. The chamber says its membership is committed to promoting a business climate that is favorable to both local and foreign investors. They note that differing opinions are no excuse for violence or illegal acts. They are urging the Prime Minister and his government to, quote, unequivocally communicate to local and foreign investors alike that Belize steadfastly upholds the rule of law and is a country that is serious about doing business, unquote. Just ahead, the tug of war over travel insurance continues. The latest response from the BTB up next. But first, here is a weather update with data from the Belize Met Service. This weather update is brought to you by SMART. This weather update was brought to you by SMART. Congrats to all our December winners of BEL's Customer Rewards. Petronilla Tooth from Orange Walk won the electric washer and dryer combo. Yvonne August from Belize City won the electric stove. Melissa Arana from Dangriga won the 65-inch Smart TV. Abram Dyke from Blue Creek won the 22,000 BTU air conditioner. Del Marie McNeil from Belize City won the side-by-side -side fridge. Alri Bennett from Belmopan won the laptop. Norman Bengouche from Punta Gorda won the toaster oven. Deborah Ordones from Belize City won the microwave. Barbara Arup from Belize City won the Hunter ceiling fan and Laura Godfrey from Placencia won the $400 voucher for LED lights. Look out for more BEL customer rewards in 2022 and how you can get chances to win. Taking its name from the venerable father of the nation, the George Price Highway stretches 77 miles from Belize City to Benque Viejo. Originally built in the 1930s, this cross-country highway system is the artery that links Belize to Central America at the western border with Guatemala. That connection facilitates overland trade, supporting Belize's economic development. Winding its way across the scenic countryside, the George Price Highway, from Roaring Creek to Esperanza, has been fully reconstructed to meet international standards, with particular emphasis on road safety. A shorter and hassle-free commute is best enjoyed when everyone obeys the traffic laws. To reduce the number and frequency of road traffic accidents, it means that a seatbelt must be worn at all times and the speed limit observed when traveling along the highway. It also means that pedestrians must use sidewalks and crosswalks where available. Buses should only board and discharge passengers at a designated bus stop. Road safety is everyone's responsibility. It begins with you. My parents always said, when it's time to build, invest in quality products that last a lifetime, even if it means paying a little more. 
It is now my turn to invest in my own home and it's not even a question. It has to be Oran Windows. My contractor recommends Oran because of the heavy duty construction, the thickest gauge blades on the market and the dual locks that allow lower louvers to close independently for privacy while the top remains open for airflow. These features make Oran aluminum louver windows the best on the market. With Oran Aluminum Louver Windows, you get strength, durability, and beauty with an added layer of security and protection against debris and damaging winds. Come in and check out the variety of sizes and colors at Design Depot, located at Mile 3 Philip Goldson Highway in Belize City. Bringing people together has always been SMART's mission and passion. That is why we are proud to have built a locally independent quality network from the ground up that spans the country with over 100 sites. We continue to add more affordable mobile data packages, broadband speeds, and voice services to meet your personal and business needs. SMART has set the standard of true competition with the most competitive prices on all services offered. We invite and welcome you to join the SMART family, where the value for your dollar matters. SMART will continue bringing new technologies, more affordable prices, network expansions, and people together. SMART, bringing people together. Fifteen major properties have come out against the travel insurance that the Ministry of Tourism plans to impose on February 15th. On Monday, we reported that the Belize Tourism Industry Association has come out in support of the insurance that will cost each traveler approximately $18, but will assist with their accommodation and hospital expenses if they are to contract COVID-19 and need quarantine or medical services. But according to these major hotels, the insurance puts them at a disadvantage. So we're trying to help to protect the industry. Um, we have almost 900 properties throughout this country. Uh, and most of them are under 10 rooms. Uh, most of them, after two years of being devastated by COVID, are on the brink. And so we have to ensure that even, not only the big players survive, but also the small players. We are in constant communication with the Ministry of Health, but there are many, many countries around this world that do require insurance to go in, and that is still a reality. I speak to ministers who still have the, um, the, that requirement as a part of the protocols for entering their country. Are you planning on dialoguing with these 15 hotels because they say they haven't gotten any response from the ministry or the prime minister has given them a response? That, that is not true. We've responded already. A travel insurance portal is set, is still in the works and expected to be ready by early next week. In time for February 15th, when the requirement comes into effect. But some hotels say cancellations are already rolling in because the portal is not up and running. Tourism Minister Anthony Mahler says the delay is giving insurance companies the opportunity to satisfy the provisions to become an option for visitors on the portal. I, I don't agree with that. I really don't agree that if that is the case, then we'll have to, to talk to those properties. But I, from, as I understand it, the portal should be up by next week, early next week, so um, well in advance of the, the February 15th um, launch date. So then don't you think that it's too reduced of a time because obviously travelers plan their trips way ahead? No, but the insurance is just being purchased. They can still, um, they can still plan to come to Belize. They, they can purchase any time. It takes seconds. And the uh, portal is needed for what purpose? To purchase the insurance. But then you said that it wasn't going to be localized, that they could purchase international insurance. No, yes, but it depends on which insurance. The insurance has to be approved by the BTB because not all insurance, not all international insurance has a cancellation po policy. There is no exclusivity. The insurance is open to any company that meets the requirements that BTB has established, including a cancellation policy. That is a critical part of what we want as a part of this insurance policy. 
Even though the number of new COVID infections is in the triple digits daily, there seems to be a slight dip in the overall infection rate. There are now more recoveries than infections. Deputy Regional Health Manager for the Central Health Region, Dr. Melissa Diaz-Musa, said that while the infection rate varies from district to district, the numbers are gradually reducing, particularly in the Belize district. It depends on the district, but with regards to Belize district, we were at um, a height of um, four or five hundred cases sometimes a day in um, the latter part of January. And over the last week, we noticed these numbers going down 200, 160. And our positivity rate is also fluctuating um, per district. But the national um, positivity rate is fluctuating between 20 and, and 28% at this time. Which would mean we're on the verge of seeing an overall reduction countrywide? Well, yes, we noticed that the recoveries now have, um, like you quite rightly said, it's more now than the number of cases detected. Um, it's pretty early, you know, it's only, we're only looking at this trend for a few days and we don't want to be too hasty to say that, you know, this is definitely where it's going. But we have also noticed at our testing sites in the Belize district that the number of people coming in who are symptomatic are also less. So prior to, um, a week and a half ago, we were having hundreds of persons being tested at each site, and now we're seeing that number reducing to 50, 60 persons at each, at each site, with the Civic Center being um, staying steadily above 100 persons going there for regular testing. So um, for the Belize District, yes, we are seeing a decline in numbers, but nationally we've got to continue to monitor the other districts and to see what the trend will be over the next week or so. And while you may be concerned about the numbers shooting up again, when the land borders are reopened, Dr. Musa said that very strict protocols are being introduced at those facilities. And I think that the, um, the way that we're moving forward is um, very, very much the safest way that we should open the borders. We have included um, improving on surveillance at the borders. We've included the, um, the importance of being vaccinated prior to crossing the border. And we're starting to um, to open the border in phases, you may say, because you know at this time we have a set a schedule of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and we have certain criteria that must be met in order to um, cross over the border. So we are contented with what is being done at this point. And yes, the situation remains very fluid. We know that numbers may go up, um, up and down depending on the um, circumstance, but with us educating our um, population, ensuring that when you go over, you continue to take your precautions, you don't let your guard down. We are hopeful that um, we will be successful in the reopening of the borders. Up next, Miss Earth Destiny Wagner takes on a new role. Find out about her new environmental advocacy position when we return. What is the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine? The Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is an RNA vaccine that triggers our immune system to develop antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. It helps to reduce hospitalization, severity of the disease, and death. What is the Pfizer vaccine made of, and is it safe? The Pfizer vaccine is made up of mRNA messenger ribonucleic acid, which are molecules that carry the genetic information needed to make proteins, lipid, salts, and sugar. It is safe for persons 12 years and older and does not contain the COVID-19 virus, hence cannot cause infection. Tests have shown that the vaccine is effective against current virus variants. Who should take the Pfizer vaccine? The Pfizer vaccine should be taken by persons 12 years of age and older who do not have severe allergic reaction after a previous dose of vaccine or have not had severe allergic reaction to any ingredient of this vaccine. Two doses of the vaccine are required three weeks apart. If you are between the ages of 12 and 17 years, you are required to present a signed consent form before you are vaccinated. What are the side effects of the Pfizer vaccine? Some common side effects of the Pfizer vaccine are headache, fatigue, muscle pain, fever, 
chills, and swelling at the injection site. If side effects persist, contact your doctor as soon as possible. Does the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine prevent infection and transmission? No, vaccination alone does not prevent infection and transmission. We are still required to continue to wear masks properly, physically distance, wash and sanitize hands often, practice proper coughing and sneezing hygiene, and avoid crowds. It's a fact that your credit lasts longer when using smart. During these times, we're all trying to find ways to cut costs and save the little resources we have. With smart, it's easy to do that. It's a fact that with smart, your credit lasts longer. You can call smart to smart and smart to digi using your promo credit. While with the other guy, you can only call on net, digi or BTL numbers. What does this mean? You get to call any national number using your promo credit. Your promo credit is free. So that call is also free. Know your facts. Don't be tricked by the other guy. Be smart and save a dollar. Connecting people. Creating memories. At the Glaze of Kitchen, I just prepared this amazing broccoli. Sharing a smile. Next Gen, the ultimate digital experience. A memorandum of understanding has been signed between APAMO and the BTB to bridge the gap between the environmental NGOs and the tourism sector. After numerous site visits and continuous talks, a formal partnership was created between the tourism industry and the biggest umbrella of protected areas NGOs in Belize. Following the signing, a $75,000 check was also handed over to APAMO. And it is a simple concept for me. The natural resources that we have, along with our um, diversity of our cultures, our culture, uh, the natural resources, those are the base, or provide a base for the tourism industry. Uh, without the mag magnificent um, marine resources that we have, uh, and the flora and fauna, that we have, um, we would just be another destination. But God, like I've said before, the anthem, bless us with wealth untold. And now we as people have to manage those resources that we were blessed with. This is unprecedented. This is historic that just a couple months after the minister taking office, not the idea, right? But I say it behind his back too. We actually had a forum right here. It's nearly about a year now. And this is the fruits of that meeting. And so many speak, but the action is always missing or it comes late. Today is a testimony of that commitment by your, your ministry, by BTB, um, by your staff, that you really, really embrace the NGO community, the non-state partners who have been stewards of our protected areas for decades. With the vision of fostering growth of the dynamic Belize tourism product for everyone to enjoy, the BTB is actively engaging its partners and stakeholders via <coughs> execution of innovative strategies, partnerships to market, develop and enhance the tourism sector. There is a need to incorporate ecotourism for economic well-being with our many communities by supporting the growth of our environmental NGOs. The protection of the environment, the provision of socio-economic benefits for surrounding communities, and the conservation of cultural heritage are among the goals of the MOU. To assist with the promotion of these objectives, Miss Earth 2021 Destiny Wagner has been tapped by the BTB as the country's sustainable tourism ambassador. We're extremely excited to share with you today that joining us is Miss Earth Destiny Wagner, 
who has graciously agreed to be Belize's sustainable tourism ambassador for both our local and international markets. This occasion today is therefore a fitting one for us to make such an announcement as it solidifies our endeavors for sustainable tourism. It is an honor to have represented Belize and to continue to represent Belize as we are on the forefront of sustainability and conservation. To Apamo, thank you for all that the efforts that you have done and all of the efforts that you will continue to do. And I look forward to working beside Belize Tourism Board to not only promote, but to protect our beautiful Belize. So it's really important that we work together with our ministries, as well as our nonprofits, as well as with our youth, because when we are together and fighting for a great cause, there's nothing that we cannot achieve. Public assistance is being sought to help a husband and wife couple out of a dire situation that they are facing. Elmer Martinez is blind and unemployed and has been living in a deplorable condition. Earlier today, we followed community activist Moses Sulf into an area of Belize City to meet the couple. News 5's Isani Kayatano has the story. For a few months after being evicted by their former landlord, Martinez has been visually impaired for the past nine years and since going blind has been struggling with meeting the bare necessities. This house has, right there that I have, it is just the same as you are out here in the opening because whenever it's rain, the whole house gets wet. Over for our bed get wet, you know, everything for us get wet. So I, I didn't really worry much because I see that I know my condition, that I, I, I can't really get the help. I can't do nothing for myself. And then I talk to families and they not try to give me no assistance. One sister looked on me and told me, um, no worry, I will, I will help you. I will see how I could get zinc and stuff for you. But they know no kind of help. They don't get back to me. I Martinez's cry was heard by community activist Moses Solf who is back at it again, seeking out this destitute couple in Belize City to solicit public assistance on their behalf. Here I did a post a couple of weeks ago with his condition when I was delivering some groceries because he had informed me that he lived back here now. And I was able to fortunately got someone to donate a um, thousand dollars in the honor of Miss Jinx Julie Lindo, who is a Belizean American, um, to start the process in trying to build him a 12 by 12 decent house where he doesn't have to be so close to the element or in the water. I'm asking for the Minister of Housing, um, the, the, the Mayor of Belize City, and the councillors to kindly um, contribute towards matching this so we can build a house within the next month for this gentleman. I have, I have commitments from persons who are willing to do the labor. So I am asking now for the material or the money. And I'm also asking the Minister of Housing. I mean, there are a lot of people like this in our city. And I think um, what the, the Office of the City Council can do is since they have about 10 to 15 mayor, I mean councillors and a mayor, I think um, if each councillor would donate part of their stipend, I think $1,000, that would be 10, they would be able to build a house for people like these each month, which have, would have been 12 house for the month. Anyone wishing to assist in this endeavor can contact Moses Self at phone number 667-4151 or make a cash deposit at Atlantic Bank account number 211-598-332. Reporting for News 5, I am Isani Cayetano. A woman whose house collapsed received a new one from the Ministry of Housing. Margaret McDougall had been living in the decrepit structure for the better part of 20 years, and one day it went crashing to the ground, leaving her with no choice but to share space with a sister. Today, McDougall got her new house, right in time for her upcoming birthday this weekend. Here are highlights from that handing over late this evening. What we are doing, ladies and gentlemen, is changing lives one at a time. That is what is special about this project. Changing of individual lives. You now, mom, have a house, shelter above your head that you have no worries about. And that is what we want, to make sure that the people that have the need have access to something that they can hold close to their heart, something that they can take 
to the bank, something that you can use to better and empower your life. This is on the pilot project. This is not on the housing scheme um, that will be presented in the next fiscal year. So these houses, you pay a portion of it back at $25 a week for 10 years. Okay. And for the working class now, let's say I would like a house or an extension on mine. Well, the extensions, we haven't opened that yet. Um, where it comes with the working class, we are looking at National Bank and DFC to open avenues for those applications to be vetted at housing. We are dealing strictly with the, the criteria that I told you, single parent, unemployed, um, self-employed, because self-employed people have a lot of difficulty getting financing and, um, and disabled persons. Okay. And that's the news. Tonight's broadcast is available in both text and streaming video at channel5belize.com. You can also connect with us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news5live. I'm Sabrina Daly. Thanks for joining us. And from all of us here at News 5, please remember to wash your hands, keep your social distance, and stay safe. Good night.